Hi, this is Lex, and welcome to the Fintech Blueprint. It's your podcast about fintech, decentralized finance, digital banking, investing, robo-advice, artificial intelligence, and all the other frontier technology that is transforming financial services. To get more content, like an illustrated transcript of this conversation in your inbox, subscribe at fintechblueprint.com. So without further delay, let's jump into today's episode. Brian, welcome to the Fintech Blueprint. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's it's so exciting to chat to you. It's a really uh, fantastic moment in Fintech as it seems to be every week. Um, so for our listeners, Brian is the CEO of M1 Finance, uh, a uh, really compelling, quickly growing uh, digital investing company. And I'm really excited to explore its story and explore how it's different to the other things that are happening in fintech and learn about this next generation offering. So Brian, maybe we can just start off with a little bit of your your background, your journey, and how that led you to, to the fintech space. Yeah, absolutely. So probably the most pertinent part of the background is I was just exposed to finance and investing at quite a young age. So parents showed me a brokerage account, sort of 10, 11 years old, said, this is investing. You can place a trade. You can invest in a company. Um, and I think their perspective was they wanted me to have exposure. They said, you know, hey, if this interests you at all, you can learn more. If it doesn't, you got to learn the basics. And from a really early age, I was just captivated by the notion of investing. There was you know, sort of this hairy intellectual puzzle out there of what is the company doing? What's it competing against? What's it worth? A qualitative or a quantitative assessment of, you know, what is it generating from a revenue perspective, profits and the like? And then you're placing a high conviction bet behind it. And so it was intellectual problem with stakes attached, which just really captivated me from a pretty young age. So did that middle school, high school into college, uh, did undergrad at Stanford, where I majored in econ and math, um, did a stint at a hedge fund and a management consulting firm prior to starting M1. And it was really from the young age developing the natural fluency with personal finance and really at you know the age of 25 saying, these tools that I'm using to manage my money really haven't changed all that much since I was 10, 11 and was first exposed. And thinking that the you know, the consumer applications outside of finance had increased in dramatic fashion. Everything got better. And for some reason, inside of finance, they, they seem to be relatively stagnant, despite it being a massive, you know, fundamental need for people to manage their, their own finances. And so creating M1 is really the manifestation of the personal finance account I wish existed in the marketplace that didn't. Uh, we started with an online investing platform. And so the investing platform is the brokerage account that I wish existed. And we have since migrated to more of a holistic personal finance platform where you can invest, borrow, spend, and really automate any dollar to optimize your personalized financial plan. So uh, I'm excited to go into the the sort of operating part about the company, but I want to kick around a little bit about your personal psychographics and the sort of statement that the investing tools out there, you know, even three, four years ago were the same as 15 years ago. And I think that ties very closely to probably how you want to put money to work. So these may sound like silly questions, but do you like trading? Do you like investing? What's What about it appeals to you? Yeah, for, for me and for our user base, it's all about investing, which we differentiate pretty substantially versus trading. Uh, whereas trading, we talk about it as, you know, doesn't really matter what the underlying company is doing or the like, you're just trying to play the price movements and buy it for one price, sell it to another uh, person for a higher price in a short amount of time. And you know, sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong. If you're right, you make money. The nice thing is it's it's short term. And so you can see your results in a short amount of time versus investing is really about buying ownership in the underlying company or the underlying asset. And what you're doing is you're taking a stake of all the value that that company accrues over long periods of time. And so I, I think the sort of moniker of are you an investor or are you a trader is sort of the Warren Buffett quote, would you be okay if you didn't get a price quote or you couldn't sell it for five years? If you're fine with that, you're more of an investor. You're, you're buying the underlying asset and you're comfortable with what you own and what it produces over time. Um, I think M1 is much more geared towards that long-term investing mindset, and it's all built around portfolio management rather than stock trading. And so the principle is you should be able to tell a software platform, this is what I want my investment portfolio to look like on a percentage basis. I want you know 15% allocated to this. I want 20% allocated to that. 
And anytime you deploy money against it, all your money should be intelligently directed into that custom portfolio. And the, the nice thing there is it attacks the common use case for an investor where it's, you know, I'm trying to put my money to work for 5, 10, 15, 20 years for my first house, my kid's education, my retirement, but I want it to go into the investments that I know and understand. And that's exactly what M1's built. We've built a free automated brokerage where you can design a custom portfolio. You can customize the portfolio to your heart's content. We have a bunch of templates to get started, sort of similar to the RoboAdvisor-esque allocations, but you can customize it with any stock or ETF that you want to invest in, all done on a percentage basis, a really intuitive way to construct and organize the portfolio. And then you just deploy money against it and it all goes to work. And we're doing a lot of creative things in the background to make that happen. Absolutely. You know, so I think the combination of asset allocation with single security selection, with fractional shares, um, with automated rebalancing and a portfolio management approach kind of massively customized is is really interesting. I still want to dig into your philosophy, which is, you know, even today, do you, you think that when you buy a stock, it reflects cash flows in the company and um, and an ownership share and that investors buy stocks because they they understand the companies that they invest in like I've seen the world self I've seen the word self-directed on your website and so you know is it do, do you hold the belief that you know an individual can do research and make an investment decision based on information out there like how, how do you approach why or when somebody should be putting money to work? Yeah. So in some sense, creating M1 was sort of a reaction to feeling like the world had split in one of two fashions. The one, one fashion was you need to outsource it completely. You need to hand it to a mutual fund, an advisor, or put it passive in a, you know ETFs. And you should have no control, sort of the, you know, the moniker of you know, individual investors are not intelligent enough to manage their own money. They should hand it off to experts. Or it's moved into the hyper trading uh, platforms where you should buy at 10 a.m., sell at 1030. You should do levered options and you should you know, tr- try to play the earnings call and play momentum and you know, in, in some sense, just try to be short term reacted. M1 is sort of the middle ground. It's saying you should be long term oriented. You should be buying ownership stakes in companies or asset classes. You know, you can buy ETFs that represent an asset class, uh, the S&P 500, whatever it may be. And you should systematically deploy to that portfolio over time. And it, it is sort of a mix between the two philosophies of, I, I do think over long periods of time, price has to trend towards value. That you are buying an ownership stake and over the long periods of time, the ownership stake is going to reflect what the underlying company does, produces, spits off as cash flow or you know the like. I think in the short term, as we've seen in the last couple of weeks, anything can happen. There can be like short term, everything is driven by short term supply and demand. And if those get out of whack, it can send the price really anywhere. I still think that's a, a harder game to predict. And I think it's, we encourage a individual to be engaged in their portfolio, that we say, it's very hard to succeed at anything if you outsource it completely. If you say, I don't care about it, I'm having someone else manage it. It's really hard to be engaged, participate. And truthfully, the, the most fundamental the most fundamental thing that leads to a higher net worth is not whether you underperform or outperform the index by 15 basis points. It's whether you contribute 15% of your salary to investments at any given time or 2%. You know, it, it, that, those are the, the fundamental things. That being said, I do think trading is on net a losing battle, that it's sort of a zero sum game between the winners and losers. Even with low transaction fees, you're going to eat the spread every time. It's hyper tax inefficient. Uh, people are probably outmatched from an information perspective. And so We are very anti-trading because fundamentally, we don't know what something's worth at 10 a.m. versus 1030 or the the random fluctuations that drive that movement. We are very pro engaging with your investment portfolio and buying things that you know and understand and that leading to positive behavioral outcomes of adding more to your portfolio, systematically contributing to it, and being a little bit more patient as value takes a long time to to build and you're not as reactive to short-term noise. So I think one thing that you guys have done really remarkably is articulate a value proposition to this kind of activish in the middle type of investor that is sticky and that's actually meaningful. And 
you know, I'll just play my cards here, which is to say that the two extremes that you describe are or have been by fintech quite strongly targeted and served, right? So on the one side, the betterments and wealth fronts of the world offering a packaged asset allocation that is largely devoid of alpha, but is about that that recurring investment. And at best, within that investment philosophy, you would say, you know, 10 or 20% of some pie chart is dedicated to my opportunistic investing, and that's done somewhere else, right? So even though people talked about that opportunistic portfolio, it was never implemented in a nice technology-led way. And then on the other side, you've got the free brokerages and Robinhoods and, and that model, which really just requires volume. And volume is volume is the cocaine of the financial industry. It's, it's um, exhilarating, but very bad for your long-term financial health. And I think the common wisdom is the wrong word, but the assumption was that it was really hard to build something in the middle that was able to capture people who wanted to have a say in their investment implementation, they you know they didn't want to take the BlackRock models and just go go forward with a 60-40 portfolio, but at the same time did not want to be flying around in the world of derivatives and sort of the astrology of technical technical chart reading and things of that nature. And I'll bring up you know Motif uh, as a company that had tried to do this, and then. Kaching, which is the prior incarnation of Wealthfront, which had tried to target this demographic, and they were they were not able to do it right. It was either you know social following to to try and create a trading in that manner, or it was portfolios that you couldn't quite customize, even though they were tilted towards particular themes. And I'd love to hear your view on why your mil- you know millions of people that are engaging with with your services, why you think you've solved this client base and kind of given them something really existential, which comes out in your performance. uh, But I'd love to hear how you think about it. Yeah. So, you know, with the demographic that we're talking about, the person who says, I'm engaged with my finances, I generally like it, I have a perspective, I'm managing modest to large sums of money, but I don't want to be a professional day trader. I don't need 15 screens up on the, like in front of me with a laptop and drawing crazy charts and lines over it, uh, trying to predict the future. That is actually a quite massive market. That's the same group that watches CNBC, reads Wall Street Journal, goes to Forbes, reads Seeking Alpha, participates on Reddit investing. And so this is a huge, huge market. And traditionally, they have used the self-directed brokerages of Ameritrade, E-Trade, Fidelity, and Schwab. The weird thing about that is they've all all of those brokerage platforms that I just mentioned are fundamentally trading platforms. Um, They base every action around the trade. So it's buy this security, this order type, this amount, click a button, previously get hit with a commission. You know, now that has gone away, but they make money on the trade. And, you know, (laughs) I like the phrase that uh, volume is the cocaine of the finance industry. They're just trying to encourage activity. But a lot of those people What they're trying to do is really build a diversified investment portfolio of things that they know and understand and want to hold for incredibly long periods of time. M1 has just been one of the first brokerages, you know, you you mentioned a couple others that didn't get as much traction as we have, that really fundamentally put the user perspective very directly in build your portfolio and automate your portfolio. Tell the software platform, this is what I want to own at any given time and then just deploy money against it. Don't worry about the manual things of placing trades or how much or are you overbalanced or underbalanced. Software is just better suited for that. It can do the math a lot easier than a human can with pen and paper or calculator. And so it's leave the mundane administrative to the computer to implement, but you set the direction, you set the personalized plan, and we can do it for incredibly low cost and we offer the service for free. It's very difficult to know why we've succeeded where others have done something tangentially related um, and failed, you know, could talk about the the nuances and difference. I think if we were to analogize it to another industry, it's sort of like the movie industry and saying, you know, hey, someone created a comic book movie and it failed. And then, you know, another person did a comic book movie and it succeeded. And it, it says nothing about comic book movies, but it fundamentally says, is the movie good? Is it entertaining? Does it provide a, a compelling user experience? And I think M1 has very uh, purposefully built for a long-term self-directed investor who has a perspective, who wants to make choices, but then have it be automated by a a software platform. 
Um, and you know, we, we've branched out and offer other uh, financial service product to create the, the holistic platform. And I think we've just done it in a more compelling user experience fashion that you know people who use the, the product love it, rave about it. We have you know 28,000 people in our Reddit community who talk about how they use M1, share investment ideas. We have 25,000 plus five-star ratings on the app store of people who are using it, enjoying it, loving it. And so I think it, it's really a combination of the fundamental principle of who we're going after, who we're serving, and delivering the best tool on the market for them, as well as just doing it in a very compelling user experience fashion. Absolutely. I mean, you are the um, you're the, the Avengers of the <laughs> prudent, self-directed investor rather than the uh, the fantastic four for the same audience. So I, I totally get it. And I, I may steal that, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, it's please. It reminds me a little bit also of, um, you know, when you think about like advisor technology. So financial advisors have a number of different investment philosophies, the same way that individual investors do from passive allocation all the way through to active management. And there had been a number of advisor focused tools that help separately managed accounts rebalance or rebalance against models. And in particular, there's a firm called Smartleaf that I had worked with in the past that was doing this really valuable thing of just rebalancing the portfolio and being thoughtful about uh, you know tax loss harvesting and and making it easy. And I think this is part of the general trend of financial products being much more directly held by people that need them and use them. And that the intermediation that we saw, you know, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, where it was, like you said, assumed that you need a financial doctor to bake you the pie chart, that is less and less true. So let's pause a little bit on the offering of the company, right? So we've talked about the pies, the allocations. Can you flesh out a little bit more sort of the the full offering and how it fits together and how you see maybe how it came together to be that package? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we take a talking about what you just hit on. We think that in the future, people will be self-directed via a digital platform simply because it offers a massive cost advantage that is quite difficult to replicate on a person by person, uh, you know, face to face interaction perspective. And it's really a fundamental belief that everybody should be able to use a digital platform, say, this is how I want my money managed or my finances managed across everything that I do with my finances. And then the software intelligently optimizes that personalized plan. So the, the future is every single person has a personalized financial plan uh, across how they invest, borrow, and spend their money. Software automates it by default. And so all the beneficial behaviors are happening by default. You don't have to consistently remake them, but you have as much control as you want to have in the process or, you know, to, to tune the dials as you see fit. And so, you know, when we talk about a person's finances, we say they have to manage their own personal balance sheet. So their assets and liabilities or investments and borrowings, and then they have to manage their cash flow, how they spend and receive money. And so M1 has you know, made it a little bit more consumer friendly where we say it's how you invest, how you borrow and how you spend your money. And we have a product that attacks each one of those verticals. And our philosophy is to have a best in class product across each one of those three verticals, but then have them seamlessly integrated and automated across that so that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So we've talked about invest, that's free automated investing in a custom stock and ETF portfolio. We then added M1 borrow, which lets you borrow using your portfolio as collateral at incredibly low interest rates. So you can borrow up to 35% of your portfolio's value, your invest portfolio value at rates as low as 2%. And so the use case there is if you have a $200,000 M1 Invest portfolio, you're going to have a $70,000 line of credit at 2%. And it's always available. You don't have to fill out paperwork to get it. You only pay for what you use. You can pay it back whenever. There's no prepayment uh, risk. And you can use it for whatever. So you can lever your portfolio. Uh, you can bring it off platform and use it in lieu of a auto loan or HELOC. Or you know if you want to finance a vacation instead of putting it on 18% credit card debt. Um, and so it's on-demand capital. And it's really saying, if you have a liquid investment portfolio, the finance firm in the background should be able to use that to facilitate lower cost credit than you can get anywhere else. We then added M1 Spend, uh, which is an integrated digital checking account. It's everything that you'd expect with a checking account. So you have an account and routing numbers, so you can direct deposit, you can bill pay, and you get an M1 issued debit card. 
Uh, we have two versions of that. One is a completely free version. The other is a uh, paid with an annual fee that gives you 1% interest on your cash balance, as well as 1% cash back through the M1 debit card. That paid version also gives you benefits across invest and borrow. So, you know, it's a best in class product within each one of those three verticals of invest, borrow, spend. And then it's really focused on the automation and synergistic effects between those three. And so it's really, you know, replace your checking account have direct deposit into the account. As your cash balance goes above a threshold that you set, you can sweep it over to your investments. You can first you know, max out your IRA. Then once you max out your IRA, it can spill over to your taxable account. All your money's invested in the securities you want in exact proportion to what you want for free. And if you ever need liquidity or your cash balance drops too low, you can tap into a line of credit at the lowest interest rate on the market. And so it's really more digitizing the private bank experience and providing a comprehensive, holistic personal finance platform. And we just started with invest, added borrow, then added spend, just because it's a, it's a lot to bite off and chew to, to create a brokerage, digital lending arm, digital bank, uh, all in a short amount of time. Well, it's definitely a testament that these strategies are available to do now, right? That you are able to combine and launch as part of a new company fairly rapidly digital banking, digital investing, spending on a pretty rapid time frame. I'm really interested in some of the plumbing of how this comes together. I promise you that our listeners are interested in the plumbing as well. And so I want to kick around a little bit how these products are structured. I think another comment is that the distinction that historically has been in place between these different verticals, certainly from a regulatory perspective, doesn't really exist from a consumer perspective. It's not relevant that this is an investment account and this is a banking account and this is a credit account. From what entity you're using you know, to put that together for a normal person is just your money and where it goes inside of the tech app. And so historical barriers are kind of disintegrating. And I think what you're building out is a really good example of, of that happening. And if we look at the industry as a whole, you, you know, you see also the many of the B2C fintech brands moving in this direction, right? So SoFi's SPAC documents were very explicit about trying to get out of just the student lending and personal lending business and into wealth and cash accounts and all that. Similarly, most brands, regardless of where they start, try to try to build the super app. Can you talk a little bit about the adoption part of these different pieces of the app and you know the sort of holy grail of cross sell like which things are leading where do you see the most growth how do you think about the growth what does success look like yeah you, you know you hit on a lot of great points and agree with everything that you said i do think there we we might take a minor distinction of what we think the finance super app ultimately means despite a lot of people talking in, in very similar fashions. And I think we approach it less from a cross-sell uh, perspective, even though ultimately what that's what we're doing. But it's historically, we think that's what the banks have done. They've you know had a checking account and then they have you as a financial customer. And so they'll try to cross-sell you with a mortgage or an auto loan. And then they will say, hey, we already have a financial relationship. We should also own your investments. Let's go buy a brokerage. We'll rebrand it. But really what that feels like is different products under the same brand umbrella. And it's not like any one of the products get better because you're using one. And so, you know, when we think about it, it's really how does one enhance the other? And the, the perfect example of that is our invest borrow uh, dichotomy, where if you invest for free, we can offer you better rates on borrowing than you can get anywhere else in the market. And so it's not necessarily that we're like we ultimately are trying to cross sell and, and have more engagement, but we're trying to do it in a fashion where the products enhance one another and it makes sense to aggregate on M1 rather than putting together a bunch of point solutions and having a finance folder in your phone with 15 different apps. And it's really saying, you know, if, if all of this works together, seamlessly integrated, automated, it's better than what you could ever get with, with point solutions. And you know, it's it's incredibly easy to analogize yourself to the most valuable company in the world, but it's sort of like the Apple ecosystem where each product in isolation, the iPhone's incredible, the Macs, you know, the laptops are incredible, the ear pods are great, Apple Music and TV are great. But it's really when you dive into that ecosystem and say, hey, this is my 
consumer facing you know operating system is really when the magic happens and everything just seamlessly works together and it's better than having you know an android and an hp because they're not linked and the like and so m1 really approaches it from that capacity and so historically we have started as an investing platform so that's the only thing that you could do we then added borrow about 18 months after that and so you know you had two products that you could use and cross out and we now have uh, spend, which we launched about seven months ago. And so, you know, the the adoption cycle has sort of followed that production uh, deployment cycle, but it's really people are signing up for the M1 platform. And, you know, a- as we continue to grow and orient, you sign up for one a- account with M1, we will do the administrative work in the background to set up your brokerage accounts, your IRAs, your uh, checking accounts. We are going to be adding credit cards. We're going to be adding other loan type options. You just use M1 as a whole to manage all of your finances. You say, this is how much I want to spend. This is how I want to automate my budgeting. This is where I want to invest. And we as a finance firm will also underwrite the individual as a person as opposed to for a sort of specific need and and just line up lines of credit or uh, loan facilities for them and say, hey, you can borrow this amount against your liquid portfolio at this rate. You can borrow this amount against your house at this rate. You can borrow unsecured at this rate. So just go about life and and do what you need to manage your finances in a compelling fashion. And the finance firm sort of like takes on the legal regulatory compliance work to just, just make it happen so that it feels like it's just, there's a team in the background optimizing your finances. It's just happening through a digital platform. Let's look a little bit at the engine. So looking at your site, you have the holding company, which of course it's a financial entity. And then within the holding company, you've got an SEC registered broker dealer, which is the, I guess the, the initial business M M1 finance LLC. And then you've got a relationship with Lincoln savings bank, which is an FDIC member for the spending accounts and the, the debit card. So let me double click on, on this, right? So with the broker dealer, who are you custodying with? How did you think about who can support you know, fractional shares and all this stuff? Yeah. So the broker dealer M1 Finance LLC is that registered FINRA member uh, and that powers our invest and borrow product. Over time, borrow will be expand beyond the portfolio line of credit. And so that will be another entity, but for the user's perspective, <laughs> shouldn't matter for your audiences, just you know, for, for information purposes. We are what's called an introducing broker dealer, and we sit on top of Apex as our custodian firm. And so they do the settlement and clearance of trades, and they're where the actual securities are held and custodied. Um, They were, you know, they're they're one, they power a lot of the the fintech apps. So SoFi, Stash, Betterment, they used to do uh, Robinhood and Wealthfront, but those companies have have left, and Robinhood self clearing, uh, Wealthfront clears on an omnibus basis. And, you know, they, they, allowed a lot of the tech-driven APIs that we needed to facilitate our company and growth. So API-driven account opening, you know, we're signing up anywhere from 10 to 25,000 new brokerage accounts a day. It's impossible to do with a paper-based process. You have to have it be highly automated. Um, they're doing you know, all the bank verifications, the ACH rails, the booking of trades and statement generation, confirm generation, tax document uh, generation. M1 has built an incredible amount of proprietary technology on top of Apex. And you know, with the portfolio allocations, the fractional share engine, um, and the like. And it really every customer at M1 can have a personalized portfolio. And you know, a a thousand dollar deposit could kick off 32 trades of different dollar amounts for you know different fractional shares. And so M1 is very likely the largest trader of fractional shares in the US. Um, we do anywhere from like three to 400,000 customer book transactions per day. And so it's a small dollar ticket volumes can generate significant amount of trades. And so, you know, we've built a lot of proprietary technology to be able to process a significant amount of transactions in an incredibly short amount of time. Yeah, no question about that. Apex was a was a leader in API driven kind of broker dealer as a service and doesn't doesn't surprise me that you use them. And of course, that you have to build on top of that that you have to build on top of them makes sense. I have two sort of uh, sneaky questions, I, th- I think, re- related to this. Left field, just thinking about Robinhood and GameStop and all of all of our friends at the market makers. In this industry structure, does it mean that you know payments for order flow are not available because you you're using you're using an apex and that's why Robinhood went self clearing and you're not you know you're not a counterparty to a market maker or is that wrong? 
Um, no, we, we do execute through market makers. And I do think that there is, I'm sort of in that weird middle ground, you know, we were talking about the middle ground between the traders and passive investors. I'm also in the middle ground of payment for order flow that it's not as bad as people think. If anything, it, it's provide incredible liquidity so that spreads have been compressed over long periods of time. And it's incredibly small per trade. The, the sort of going rate is about 0.2 cents per share. And so our belief is for the so revenue stream, it increases liquidity in the market. It drives spreads to lower and lower. And so from an overall investor perspective, it's a net positive and a fundamental belief of if you care about PFOF as an investor, you're, you know, you're losing the forest through the trees. Uh, you know, it, it is an incredibly small amount of drag on an investment return. Um, and, you know, so the alternative would be commissions or anything, you know, more expensive. That would be a, a larger drag. So I think it's sort of the best we have. That being said, it, it sort of goes to the fundamental. If you're trading significantly, it's a zero sum game. The There are winners and losers and they even out. But whoever is facilitating that trade is taking a rake every single time. And so the, the people who facilitate significant amount of trading volumes are typically the people who profit the most out of trading activity. And I think it's more of a, the, the dynamics of payment for order flow aren't concerning, but the encouragement to trade incredibly frequently and the encouragement to trade levered options that have significant risks and, you know, with small amounts of notional volume can add incredible amounts of exposure and adds risk to the system. I think that sort of gets lost in the weeds as we talk about payment for order flow as well. And so we're sort of anti-high frequency trading, but not anti-payment for order flow. It is to some extent the emerging market structure. So two questions on on top of that. First is, you know, around the, you know, the business model and the fact that trading is free on M1 and whether uh, sort of on the trading side of the business or on the investment side of the business, that's the primary revenue stream. And the second question is around the trade windows. So I see that you're, you're implementing the trades in bulk, either once a day for uh, free users or twice a day for premium users. Can you talk a little bit about also that and sort of like how it interacts with the design of the thing? Yeah. So I'll, I'll touch first on the revenue model. So we have the three products, invest, borrow, spend, and then we have a membership fee called M1 Plus that is very similar to an Amazon Prime-esque membership where it gives you benefits across the entire platform. If you're using M1 to manage most of your finances, it more than pays for itself. And so a lot of our heavier users, you know, 25% or so are M1 plus users. We make money on the investment portion. Payment for order flow is a revenue stream. It's our smallest revenue stream. If it went to zero, it wouldn't be that material, especially because we eschew high frequency trading. You can't day trade on the platform. Our volumes are much smaller. We're doing that batch uh, trade window stuff as you, as you talked about. Um, the two more meaningful ones are securities lending. So we can take the securities that our users own on the platform and lend it out. And we're primarily doing that to facilitate short selling. Uh, it's very similar to the way banks operate of they take in deposits, they lend that out for loans. And so they might just you know provide the service for free to, to get the deposits. Then they're using that deposits to sort of leverage the other side of their business and, and monetize uh, and be that financial intermediary there. We're doing a very similar thing. And, and uh, because we own un individual securities, it's a revenue stream that's available to us that's not available to the robo-advisors, which own broad-based index ETFs. Um, and then people can hold cash on the M1 Invest platform. So we can monetize that, lend that to banks on an overnight basis to do that loan lending that we just talked about. We then have borrow. We lend at rates between two and three and a half percent. Our cost of capital is significantly less than that. And so we earn a spread on whatever we're lending at any given time. We then have M1 spend where people hold cash balances. And so we can monetize those cash balances as well as an M1 debit card. And so anytime they swipe that, we make interchange fees, which is a percentage of the transaction volume that goes through the card. And so you, you add all those together, it, it becomes pretty meaningful. And so, you know, we M1 now has about three and a half billion dollars on the platform. We've quadrupled over the last 12 months, continuing to, to grow at a very high rate and, and sort of having modest but reasonable uh, revenue streams across all product lines means that we have a robust re uh, business model across the entire platform. It's the dream. It's amazing. It's been amazing to see 
kind of the discovery of what are now foundational revenue streams for fintechs, right? But we we can see companies being built entirely on interchange, which was almost like discovered five years ago by by Silicon Valley and would, and hadn't been applied at all before. And as such, a a game changer, both because people need cards, they need to spend. They're not just trying to hold some abstract net worth in collateralized box, but also because there is the available economics from the spending and the, you know, the, the flywheel around loyalty and rewards and things of that nature. Is it difficult mechanically to get the interchange? Like how does the, how did maybe, maybe to reframe the question, when you were looking for a depository partner, how did you end up choosing Lincoln? What kind of things does it provide? Is it, you know, is that a, is banking as a service a really competitive field? And maybe if you could talk about the infrastructure on that side of the business. Yeah, for sure. So on the uh, interchange front, there's you know two big distinctions between interchange for debit card, which is typically less, and then interchange for credit cards, which is typically more. Um, a lot of that has to do with the risk parameters that on the credit side they're actually providing credit. That being said. You know, the higher interchange on credit cards is also what facilitates the cash back and rewards that, that people do love. On the debit card side, there's also two tiers of interchange. And it's really, it's much higher for banks that have less than $10 billion in assets. And then it sort of drops off a cliff if you go above $10 billion in assets. And so some of the, the things that fintechs are doing is partnering with banks that have less than $10 billion in assets and will for a long time so that they can monetize off the, the higher interchange rate. Um, it'll be an you know, interesting question of whether that dynamic changes or there's any regulatory pressure on that over long periods of time. Um, for, for us, you know, the, the, choosing the bank was a, a combination of reasons. You know, one, we did want to go with a bank sub $10 billion to monetize at the higher rate. Not many banks are, are super pro fintech. And so you know, having some that are open to relationships with, with fintechs limits it pretty dramatically. And so you know, that, that cut down the... Uh, sort of available universe to, you know, just I don't know, a handful of, of small banks. That that handful is growing over time. But then the the bank that we ultimately selected, Lincoln Savings Bank, really put a focus on fintech as a distribution channel. And so they power the Acorns card. They uh, have some partnership with Square from the Cash App perspective. They did Money Line at one point, and so you know they were more forward thinking. Of their legacy business was financing farm equipment in, in rural Iowa for for different farmers, and they potentially not the the highest growth rate from a business perspective. And so they sort of saw, hey, there are a lot of companies out there that need access to the banking infrastructure, the regulatory environment, the compliance environment, the general rails and the like. Where the tech firm was really strong at engineering and product development, they could basically license their charter and provide the services. And, and so that was a lot of the rationale of why we went with Lincoln Savings. Listen, farming's very, very important. Incredibly important. Yeah. <laughs> really, yeah. Alibaba, I think, in large part, credit, credit to farmers. I, I'd love your hot take just because I, I haven't looked at this in detail for a while, and I'm curious. You know your hot take on Green Dot, the Bancor, and I think it's CRV Charles River or CRB Charles River Bank. Maybe I'm Cross River Bank. When you like, who was the comp set that you looked at that was was kind of reasonable and good? And what were the distinctions that made you go with one over the other? Yeah, so we 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 looked at all of those. Then there's a handful of other private banks that may not be well known or have a, a huge retail focused presence that also offer the service to partner with fintechs. There is a little bit of a difference in how M1 approaches the market versus some of our fintech peers, where a lot of our fintech peers view everything in terms of or in terms of users, whereas M1 really tries to view things in terms of dollars that we monetize on assets, we monetize on liabilities, we monetize on transaction volume. And so we, we typically tend to target a little bit more of a sophisticated, more affluent user base. And, and so I think you know 80% of the money on the platform is held by people who have more than six figures on the M1 platform. So you know our, our bread and butter is five, six, low seven figure accounts. Whereas a lot of the other fintech players are going after the unbanked, the underbanked, um, you know, people who are, uh, you know, might have five hundred dollars in their checking account and sort of hover between negative and and you know two thousand. Um, for us, like the, the difference that that leads to is we really tried to monetize 
the the dollars on the platform or the transaction volume as opposed to the user themselves. And I think we are comfortable sort of saying, what do we charge as a percent of total assets on the platform? And it's, you know, it, it's a relatively small amount and we think our customers benefit significantly more than the the fees that we make on the, the back end. We do have some concern over those that sort of prioritize charging the the user and they nickel and dime and, and potentially charge more than the, the value that they're providing, especially if you sort of did, what do they earn from a revenue perspective divided by the amount of assets that they they manage? It's a very tricky conundrum because, you know, it's sort of a similar thing of what are the other alternatives? But I think for, for our perspective, we wanted to have a partner that was much more aligned with let's survey our, our, our user base incredibly well, take a very small uh, amount of that on, on serving them and not have it be perverse incentives of trying to charge people who can likely least afford it. Cool. Thank you for um, exploring how the the jigsaw puzzle fits together. I think it's, to me, it's one of the, you know, the most interesting questions because the the financials and the the adoption path of the product is a function of what it is that you put together of the car that you put together and i think again it just bears repeating that bringing these offerings together and painting a holistic financial picture that is largely automated and is aligned with how people think about their money is really core and it was pretty prohibitive to do this in the past and it is available now. And I think that's one of the reasons why you've been able to unlock this customer segment in a way that just didn't happen despite folks taking attempts at it, but now it can. If you think about the future and you think about the company over the next kind of three, four years, where are you trying to get to? What's your, what's your North star? And then as part of that, what do you think are, what do you worry about in getting to that North star? Yeah. So we, we, you know, three, four years, it's going to be continued product development, continued growth of the user base, um, just continuing to add much more value to the personalized financial automation platform, really digitizing the private bank experience. M1 really has a longer term perspective. And we talk about it as trying to be similar to what Charles Schwab did to Morgan Stanley or Merrill Lynch that, you know, Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, giant incumbent institutions managing hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars. And then Schwab came around in the you know, 60s, 70s, and 80s and said, we can deliver better product, better pricing, more digitally uh, and tech-driven focus. And it's not like Morgan Stanley and Merrill Lynch went away. You know, Some got acquired and, and merged with Bank of America. But you know, Morgan Stanley is still a $100 billion plus company. It's just Charles Schwab is also a $100 billion plus company. We, we think that there is a huge opportunity to create the next generation financial institution using 2020 technology and really incorporating all the best practices from a consumer experience perspective, from a product perspective, uh, having it be self-driven and automated and, and using software to automate and power that. And so, you know, when we think about 10, 15, 20 years out, it's really we, we do want to be a category defining company that is on the same scale as what Schwab is now. And it's, you know, Schwab their average customer might be 55, 60 years old. They have a lot of growth to do if they just retain their customers for uh, long periods of time. It's just, we think we can be that company for a next generation of investors. And so, you know, we, we think we appeal to the same mindset uh, and philosophy as the Schwab investor. We just have modernized it and are doing it to a younger user base. It's sort of the, Sh- the Schwab customer that they got in the seventies. We're just doing it in the, the 2020 version. Awesome. Thank you for um, for both the vision and, and walking through um, your views on the industry. I think there's, I usually try to argue uh, with people I talk to, but uh, we're aligned on a lot of things. I think one of the one of the things where I've been spending a lot of time thinking is um, around the manufacturing of financial products and what it means to have cash or what it means to have financial instruments or, or stocks or bonds and so on. And so there's a whole blockchain conversation, crypto access conversation that is is available to us that maybe we should have another time. But I think that'll conclude uh, our episode for today. Where should um, our listeners go to um, to find you and learn more? Yeah, so our website is m1finance.com. And then we have native apps in both app stores, the, the Apple App Store and Google Play Store. You can type in M1 or M1 Finance. We also are available on all the social channels. Cool, Brian. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was a blast. 
Hi, everyone. That's it for this week's episode of the Fintech Blueprint. For more technical deep dives into all things fintech and decentralized finance, check out fintechblueprint.com and grab a free subscription to the newsletter. This is Lex, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>